On Christmas Eve, we read the first part of this story together and were joined uh, by many musical artists who helped us enter that story uh, in a different way, in a more full way. And today, we continue in that same chapter, that same passage, um, into the next version of what's happening in Jesus' life. At this point, he's recently been born, and the scripture says the, the time has come for the purification rites and the time of consecration. So they take him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So to understand what's going on in this passage, we have to have some understanding of one, what consecration means, and two, what's involved in this particular law that is being referenced. So the word consecration is really a word that we only encounter uh, in the context of religion. And really all it means is uh, to declare or to make something sacred. And so this is very significant, a lot of cultural significance, a lot of religious significance, a lot of spiritual significance to this trip to Jerusalem to present Jesus in the temple. Um, there's also some uh, rites involved for Mary, purification rites. Um, but this particular law that's being referenced is something that comes from the book of Exodus. So let's take a look. This is Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. Verse 11. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. Now a couple things to point out here. Uh, why the firstborn or why only the firstborn? Well, the firstborn represents what is to come. And so this law that's being referenced is in direct connection to the Exodus. It was a time when the Israelites had been in slavery in Egypt and God brought the ten plagues on Egypt. If you remember, the, the river Nile turned to blood. It was frogs, locusts, ten different plagues that Egypt experienced before the Pharaoh agreed for the Israelite people to go. But the last plague, the one that really sealed the deal, so to speak, was the angel of death passing over and claiming the life of every firstborn. Now the Israelites were protected from this because they took blood, lamb's blood, and marked the doorposts. And when the angel of death saw the blood on the doorpost, it would simply pass over. Um, but if it came to a home where there wasn't blood on the doorposts, it would claim the life of the firstborn. Uh, this was a, a very difficult event in the life of Egypt, uh, but the Israelite people experienced it very differently because of the protection that was offered for them. Uh, in essence, uh, they redeemed the firstborn uh, who, so that the firstborn was not claimed in that event. Very different from the experience that the Egyptians had during that time where there was so much loss of life. Uh, this event really initiated the Israelites' exit or their exodus uh, from Egypt and from slavery. Uh, and they commemorate this event even still. Uh, it's called 
Passover. Uh, and this is an event that Jewish people celebrate every year. We're going to come back to the significance of this event in Jesus' life, him coming to the temple, his parents bringing him to the temple to be presented, and then partaking in this ritual. So when Jesus' parents present him in the temple, there are two prophets. One of them a man, Simeon, and one of them a woman, Anna. Well, specifically with Simeon, it says um, that he had been waiting. He had been told that he would see the Lord's Messiah before he died. So he is uh, waiting and the Holy Spirit is on him and he sees Jesus and he immediately goes to Jesus. He goes to their family and takes them in his arms. Uh, and he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Wow. Uh, we could certainly talk about the implications of of seeing Jesus and to announce that you have seen salvation. Uh, we could talk about that quite a long time. Uh, but there's a couple other things I want to point out with Simeon. Simeon had been waiting for the consolation of Israel, it says. And the consolation or the consoling of Israel is simply just waiting for comfort. Um, it had been a long season of disappointment as the Roman Empire had ruled over the Jewish people with an iron fist. Um, it had been a time when the cultural and religious identity of the Israelites uh, had been disenfranchised or infringed upon um, as they had lost their ability to lead themselves operating as a um, state of the Roman Empire. So he's waiting for the comforts of Israel. And when he sees Jesus, he says, you may now, Lord, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. And he had been told that he wouldn't die before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And he sees Jesus and he knows immediately the Holy Spirit reveals it to him that that is the Messiah. And so he says, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. We can only assume that he's referencing his own death. Um, now, we don't know if he is um, very old or sick or infirmed, um, but we can assume that he is older. Which brings up the question, I think it's a, a valid question, what is the Christian's posture towards death. Um, read an article uh, by uh, an, an, an old writing by the church father Augustine. And in it, he talks about death as a friend and death as an enemy. You see, death understood as a friend, that death brings the conclusion of a time period in which we are physically separated from our Creator. We exist only in this reality. Um, we do not exist in heaven. But he also talks about death as an enemy, in that our Lord is the author of life, the Creator of the world and death is the end of this gift of life that God has given us. See, we definitely have a tension when we think about death, talk about death, a tension between the already and the not yet. We've already experienced the grace and mercy of God, but there is an extent to which we have not yet experienced it in its fullest. I think Paul says it best when he says, uh, Now I see 
only dimly, but I will see more clearly. So Augustine ultimately determines that the Christian posture, or the Christian attitude towards death, is one of ambivalence. Death operates both as a friend as, and as an enemy. And so putting that together, we are left with a sense of ambivalence. We don't welcome death, but we also don't reject it either. And it seems that Simeon has adopted that posture. He didn't welcome death, but he certainly isn't rejecting the notion either. He simply says to the Lord, Now you may dismiss your servant in peace. Earlier in our service, we read the names of the individuals who have gone on, who have passed on, who have died this past year. And our prayer is that they may find peace. Simeon asks for peace. But that's not all he says. He goes on to say, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. This is very interesting. This is the first time in Luke that a ministry to the Gentiles is referenced or mentioned at all. You see, the Israelite people knew that there was a Messiah coming, a Messiah on the way. But it wasn't full understanding, it wasn't common knowledge that this ministry was going to be, that this king, this Messiah, would be for all people. It would also include the Gentiles. You see, with Jesus, we often get more than we expect. Growing up, I had a pastor who would always tell this story, the story of a young boy who had gone into town with his parents. They had gone to the, the general store, and the boy saw a pair of streamers for his bicycle that would attach to the handlebars. Um, and he, he was very intrigued, very interested in them. And uh, it was nearing the end of the year, and, and Christmas was coming up, and so he asked his parents if he could have those streamers for Christmas. And uh, his parents said, well, we'll have to wait and see. And so uh, he began to, to eagerly anticipate the day of Christmas and its arrival. Uh, he would walk past the store and, and see those streamers um, on, a, on a brand new bicycle and, and he was looking at those streamers and seeing what he desperately wanted, eagerly anticipating the coming of Christmas. And Christmas Eve came and he went to bed and was so excited that he could barely sleep. And Christmas came and he ran downstairs and asked his parents, did you give me the streamers? And his parents said, unfortunately, we weren't able to get the streamers this Christmas. And the little boy was, was absolutely dejected. He was so disappointed. He hung his head and walked outside the house. And to his surprise, in their driveway, was a brand new bicycle with streamers on the handlebars. The little boy had gotten far more than he could have ever expected. With Jesus, we get more 
than we expect. But that's not always a pleasant thing. Scripture says that Simeon uh, began to discuss with Jesus' parents. It says the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of hearts will be revealed. The rising and falling of many in Israel. You know, Jesus was a polarizing figure. He was loved by some and hated by some. He came to comfort the afflicted, but also to afflict the comfortable. Jesus upended the social order and turned religious leadership on its head. I suppose anyone who had something to lose wasn't necessarily a fan of Jesus and his ministry. You know, I can't help but think of the evolution of music in the many formats that we've seen it. Uh, you know, after World War II, um, vinyl records became very popular. And they were popular for quite some time until cassette tapes were developed. And then cassette tapes were upstaged by eight tracks. The eight tracks were around for a few years before they were replaced again by cassette tapes that had grown in their technology and could now hold more volume, could now hold more information. I still remember my brother's sedan, uh, a 1990s car that had a tape player, cassette tape player. But then soon, cassette tapes would be taken over by compact discs, or CDs. In fact, there's a famous image of Bill Gates, uh, the founder of Microsoft. Uh, and he is uh, dangling by a wire, holding a CD, and he is uh, many, many feet up in the air. And next to him is a stack of paper. And the image is, is indicating how much information could be held on one CD would be equivalent to the entire stack of paper um, and he is dangling from a harness and you see many many feet below the, the stack of paper stacked up but it wasn't too long ago that CDs were upstage and essentially made obsolete by mp3s mp3 is simply digital information and as first we had handheld players that with earphones that we would use uh, but now people play music on their phones on their televisions and computers we don't have physical devices on which the music is stored anymore we simply have the players and we may not even actually possess the musical information ourselves. These days, streaming has become very popular in which we simply access where the music is stored and listen to it. There's been lots of changes in the evolution of music, and not all of those changes were welcome. There were some who were super excited that a new format was being developed but those who had something to lose, those who were invested in the old format, typically were not fans of the new format. The arrival of Jesus definitely is a, a change in era, a paradigm shift, if you will. And if you were an individual who was invested in the prior format, the prior prior religious leadership or system of authority, 
then you had something to lose. And you saw Jesus as a threat. The rising and falling of many often has to do with who's in power and what do they have to lose. But in essence, with Christ, we all have something to gain, but we all have something to lose. You see, Christ says, when a man comes and follows me, he comes to die. He takes up his cross, he denies himself, and he follows Christ. The call to discipleship is a call to self-denial. So when Jesus shows up, we certainly have something to gain, but we certainly have something to lose. There is friction, there is a challenge. Simeon is not the only prophet who interacts with Jesus and his family that day. There is another prophet. Her name is Anna. We're not really told what Anna says, um, but we know that she is old, that she had been married for just a few years, seven years, and then she lived as a widow, fasting and praying at the temple. Now, her fasting, uh, we can interpret that as a sign of mourning, but not because of what we presume is the death of her husband, but almost as a picture of the society at the time, she is grieving the Israelite people, their status, um, the way in which they have lost their way, relied upon a system and completely missed the values of the God who set them free. And it comes to them And thanks them. She gives thanks to God. She spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And then after their encounter with Anna, Joseph and Mary return to Nazareth, where it says the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. I think it's interesting that they returned to Nazareth and it says the child grew that this would have been over a period of many years this would have been a very long process sometimes God fixes things overnight but rarely does God work like that we have to trust in God's process trust that he is at work even when we can't see it but I want to return to the beginning of our passage. And I want to point out three things about this particular ritual of consecration that Mary and Joseph placed Jesus in. Jesus is born into a covenant. And in this ritual, they are giving voice to this reality this covenant that god makes with the jewish people the israelite people when he leads them out of egypt and says as a result consecrate to me every firstborn redeem it but if you don't redeem it then break its neck every animal every firstborn and so they bring jesus to the temple and they participate in this ritual in which they offer a sacrifice to redeem Jesus. Jesus is born into this covenant. We are born into a covenant, born into an arrangement. We don't get to decide who our family is, decide our parents, decide where we're born, when we're born. We don't just show up on a blank canvas. We enter into a particular situation we also enter into a reality of sin now theologians debate this next part whether it's a original sin 
in which you believe that already before birth we exist in a sinful state, or whether you believe that at some point we lose our age of accountability and enter into this phase in which we sin and become liable individually ourselves. Depending on what you believe, Scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are born into this reality where we need redemption. And Jesus participates in this ritual. Even shortly after he's born, he participates in this ritual that reminds us of this time in which God rescued his people from slavery. We are slaves to sin before we know Christ. In fact, we are slaves to sin, and just as God led the Jewish people out of slavery under Egypt to be servants under him, very similarly, we are led out of slavery under sin to be servants to God. Shortly after his birth, Jesus participates in this ritual that rehearses this reality that we are born into sin needing redemption. And thirdly, I want to point out that in this ritual, God is clear. Let me read the passage from Exodus one more time. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offering of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among you. When he says redeem, it's it's a literal purchasing. And if, if the firstborn isn't purchased, then its neck is to be broken. The image we get here is that without redemption, there is no life. In our own lives, if we're not able to be redeemed, if we choose not to accept the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, if we choose not to receive his redemption, then we can't have life. Amen.